My name is Ken Chibi and I'm the director of the Europe Center. So today we're, we're here to uh, celebrate a, a serious uh, uh, piece of new scholarship by our colleague Norman Neymark. And uh, we could talk about uh, his many accomplishments as, as a scholar, but one of the th my reactions in, in thinking about the book was that this might be also a, an occasion to recognize his accomplishments a, as a teacher, um, given, the, given the nature of the book. And I, it, it made me think, uh, I have a teenage daughter, and a, a couple of years ago, she uh, read one of uh, Norman's book, uh, and it was uh, Stalin's Genocide. And uh, I think her, her thesis based on it was something uh, along the lines of, Neymark is wrong. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that wasn't the important part. It was really, you know, she was only in eighth or ninth grade, and it was really the, 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 pe the piece of, uh, one of the first pieces of serious work in which she saw how history could help her think more rigorously and engage more uh, seriously about really um, important contemporary concepts. And, and I think Norman has had that impact on scores, really countless uh, undergraduates uh, at Stanford University, but through his writing and scholarship, he's had that impact on many uh, uh, outside, uh, beyond uh, Stanford's campus. And I think that, that this is a, a nice uh, occasion for us to, to celebrate uh, that accomplishment. Our plan for today is for, Norman's gonna talk for a, a little bit about the book, and then we have two discussants who I will uh, um, introduce uh, after Norman speaks. So Norman, thank you. And thank you, Ken, for the nice introduction. And thanks to the Europe Center and Karen. Where are you, Karen? She's somewhere back there. For helping set all of this up. I appreciate it. I should mention, too, that uh, CSAC, which is down the hall here, is have an office there. And this was the home uh, for my well, work for the last number of years. So I'm grateful to them, too. And then I see my some students in the audience. So that's very nice who had taken my... Uh, freshman seminar on the world history of genocide, which was the origins of this book, basically. So uh, I'm glad to see them here, too. And, and thanks for that introduction. I kept thinking during your introduction about my now 13-year-old son, who also says I'm wrong about everything, <laughs> <laughs> about life, about <laughs> what he should be doing. So anyway, it's good to be wrong sometimes. OK, so I'm going to take. Um, uh, they've given me sort of 20, 25 minutes. I'm going to try to stick to the 20-minute mark um, and talk about uh, the book. And I'll just stop at the end of 20 minutes. You know, I'm just going to stop because I'd rather hear what the commentators have to say and what you have to say in terms of questions or, or comments uh, than uh, to listen to me again on the subject of genocide. So... Um, um, hi, Beth. Sorry. Yeah, you made it just in time. Uh, so let me start. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of conceptual problems uh, uh, that um, you know came to the fore uh, in doing this book, and then uh, I want to talk about some thematic issues uh, that permeate the book. And we'll see how far I get. I mean, there are a lot of thematic issues, and there are a lot of conceptual issues. So, like I said, I'll just stop uh, at some point. Say that's it. Um, okay. Uh, the conceptual issues. First of all, uh, it's pretty clear from the title of the book, uh, which was not my title. It's not a very inventive title. It comes from a world history series uh, at Oxford, and they asked me to do the volume on, um, on genocide, and they gave me the page limit uh, in which to do it, which was extremely difficult. Um, but I did it, uh, <clears throat> or they forced me to do it, let's put it that way. Anyway, the first conceptual issue, of course, is that, that genocide occurs throughout world history. It occurs throughout world history, at all times and all places. This may seem obvious, but uh, just yesterday, I'm at the Humanities Center this year, I was having lunch with three historians, and a couple of them said, how can you say there was genocide before there was a word, a concept called genocide? And I said, well, you know, the, you know, dogs are there before there's a word for a dog, too. Um, no, I didn't quite say that. But, I mean, they basically, I, you know, the argument is not that self-evident. And you have to prove in some ways that there is genocide before there was a genocide convention, before there was a definition of genocide and that sort of thing. 
So, genocide occurs throughout world history. It's embedded in human history, and that may seem also obvious, but for a very long time, we thought about genocide as uh, strictly associated with the Holocaust. There were no other genocides, and that was considered special and outside in some ways of history, instead of embedded in history. You know, gradually, I think people and genocide scholars have done a lot of work on this uh, set of issues. Gradually, people have come to the realization, I think, and the proper one, uh, that the Holocaust is obviously a horrible and terrible event, something we think about always when we think about genocide. Uh, but it's not the only genocide, and that there are other genocides, and that those genocides are important to think about and absorb into our concept of history as well. Part of this idea is that genocide also needs to be historicized. And by that I mean it needs to be placed in history, but it also needs to be linked up with other episodes of, his, of genocide in history. In other words, genocide has its own provenance, if you will, that it has its own history, that you can go back into the past and see how genocides are linked with one another. I mean, just give you a, a quick example. The first example I look at in my book is the Old Testament, right? And in the Old Testament, as if you've read it lately, I urge you, uh, if you haven't read it lately, I urge you to do so. I mean, you will find a very mean and genocidal Hebrew God asking his people to kill all of another people. And if they don't do it, uh, he is resentful and revengeful. And you must do that killing. You know, when I grew up, and you too, I'm sure, you sang that wonderful uh, gospel hymn, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Well, the hymn doesn't say that at the end, Joshua and his men killed all the inhabitants of Jericho, men, women, and children, and burned the city to the ground. Now, we don't know, of course, uh, that uh, this really happened. I mean, with the Old Testament, is a mix of fables, fiction, what people heard about and what they believed happened, but that they could conceive of it, that, the, that genocide itself you know, could be conceived of in almost exactly the same way that you might conceive of it in later periods, um, is something that works its way into history and through history and reappears. I mean, you see people talking later on about the Old Testament and later on about God's vengeance on other peoples, and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't want to go into all of these uh, episodes. Now, of course, um, genocide is not the same when perpetrated you know, by the Greeks or the Romans and when perpetrated by the Nazis or the Soviets. It changes over time. And then the book tries to show that they're kind of groups of genocides that share similar kinds of characteristics from the beginning uh, until our most recent uh, times. Um, and those changes are important, but it's also important, I believe it's also important, uh, that they share common characteristics. And they share in some ways a broad definition. And that brings me to another conceptual problem, the definition of genocide. And I, you know, I can't go into the whole uh, issue of how genocide, the concept or term, uh, uh, you know, came about. But let me, let me just say this. Um, I hold in this book and in most of my work to the notion that the uh, December 1948 uh, genocide convention, the convention on the prevention and uh, of genocide and punishment of genocide is a pretty darn good gen uh, uh, definition, which basically says, you know, acts purposefully, intentionally committed, you know, to destroy uh, an ethnic, religious, uh, racial, or national uh, group, comma, as such. And as Beth knows, that comma, as such, is very important because you're destroying, the aim is to destroy an entire, <coughs> an entire group. Or by destroying part of that group, you know, to, in some ways, eliminate that group. I think that's a good definition. I don't think it's a great definition. Taken out of the early drafts of the Genocide Convention, 
were social and political groups, which I believe belong in that definition. And if you include social, and they were taken out, by the way, primarily because of the intervention of the Soviet Union, which didn't want that in the Genocide Convention, but there were other countries as well who also felt they were susceptible you know, to being accused of genocide if social and political groups were included. The framers of the Genocide Convention were thinking about World War II. It makes perfect sense that they were thinking about World War II. And they didn't want anybody to think about anything else but World War II meaning the Jews, the Poles, the Russians, Yugoslavs who died uh, at the hands uh, of the Nazis. Okay, so my definition includes social and political groups. And what this does makes it possible to talk about genocide in the context of the killing that was done by communist regimes, which I do in the book. I talk about Stalin's mass killings. I talk about Mao's mass killings. I talk about uh, Cambodia. And if you talk about the destruction of political and social groups, it's obvious that these are genocidal uh, 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 regimes and carry out genocide against their own people. I also came across what I began to call anti-communist genocides. And this happens primarily in the Cold War. And it has to do with groups, communist groups, being destroyed by various um, juntas, uh, military groups and so on. I mean, the one that most obviously comes to mind is what happens in Indonesia uh, in 1966 when, you know, more than a half a million Indonesian communists are attacked by the Indonesian government and eliminated. You know, for the purposes of eliminating that group as such. Uh, and I include that in my concept of genocide. This is not uncontroversial. I understand it's controversial. A lot of people, not just your daughter, uh, has trouble with some of the things I write, but I think I'm right. You know, so I keep writing it. Uh, um, okay. Um, the other uh, conceptual thing to say very quickly is that it also occurs in various parts of the world. Genocide occurs all over the world. It's not just a Western phenomenon. It's not just an Eastern phenomenon. It's just not a, a phenomenon of settler, <coughs> settler societies. It occurs all over the world, and we will never know all of the genocides that occurred. I always hear about new ones. People are always telling me and writing, and I, when you read, you will never come to the end of the genocide story. Uh, I mean, it's a sad truth. I was reading a New Yorker last year about the last Selknam speaker. I don't know if anybody read that article. It's a great article. And the Selknam, I don't know how many of you know about the Selknam. I certainly knew nothing before reading this New Yorker article, or people uh, in, uh, they were called, you know, a, a nomadic people of uncertain origin who lived in Tierra del Fuego in the south of Chile, you know, very at the tip of the continent, South American continent. And there were about 400,000 of them. And that territory, that, uh, with, uh, gold was discovered. And it turned out could be very rich agriculturally. And as a result, within 25 years, uh, those Selknam were wiped out by settlers and gold miners. Not terribly different, by the way, from another case that I studied, which is the Yuki Indian up in Mendocino County. And they were gone. Um, you don't hear about these things, right? People don't write about them often. I mean, a whole series of genocides have occurred, you know, in, the, in, in sort of gen, in Chinese areas between China and Central Asia and so on. Uh, that I've heard papers on, you know, and they're very abstruse cases, but they occur all these times. Okay, so you never know them all. All right, finally, conceptually, well, I talked about the, uh, about the definition problem, so I won't go into that. All right, let me go into a few themes, okay, that run through the book. One of the themes uh, is the relationship between war and genocide. It's a very close relationship between war and genocide. In fact, if there aren't other good reasons to prevent war, uh, the fact that genocide somehow trails its way into war uh, is. And there are a couple reasons for this. You know, one is that uh, you can make the argument that soldiers who are used to battle, used to seeing blood, um, you know, used to killing, um, are able and ready uh, to do 
the deeds of genocide. I'm not sure that's always true, but it certainly is the case that, you know, formal armies, the Wehrmacht in the Second World War, for many years, people thought, you know, they didn't do it. It was the SS, right? But in point of fact, it was the Wehrmacht too. Same thing with the Turkish army in World War I with the, uh, um, uh, with the Armenians who were killed. Armies do this kind of thing, alas. You know, in Southwest Africa with the Herero and Nama, 1904 to 197, it was the German army, you know, that came down from Germany uh, and engaged in this uh, particular uh, genocidal affair. So that's part of the story. War is part of the story. Um, paramilitaries are frequently tasked with uh, genocide. That paramilitaries that are built up during a war. So again, it was the SS primarily. You know, it was the NKVD in the Soviet case. Um, you know, paramilitaries do a lot of damage. They do a lot of damage. You know, Indian wars. You know, there were a lot of paramilitaries. Not necessarily the U.S. Army who killed Indians, it turns out, but rangers, you know, various posses that are, um, that are brought on, you know, to help fight Indians, then end up uh, killing large numbers of them. That's part of the story. Part of the story is, um, is strategic arguments for genocide. I mean, one of the things we've come to understand better about the Armenian genocide in 1915 uh, was that uh, the Armenians were identified by the Young Turk regime as being located in a very strategic place in eastern Anatolia. The Russians, they were fighting against the Russians in this war, and therefore the Armenians had to be removed. Well, in removing and killing, you know, one action bleeds uh, into the next, uh, and the war was a cover in some ways for that genocide, just like war, by the way, was a cover. It wasn't much of a cover, but it was something of a cover for the Holocaust. I mean, there was not the mass murder of Jews, it's important to understand, until World War II began. And the worst of the Holocaust comes after the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. And there, you know, in the summer and the fall of 1941, the decision is reached somehow, and people, historians, of course, love to argue, and they'll argue about when that decision was reached. But the decision was reached sometime in the fall of 1941, you know, to murder all the Jews. But not until the war had already started. Okay, another theme, I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker, is dehumanization. Now, it's an important theme. It happens before genocide. It's one of those stages that leads up to genocide, but it accelerates during genocide. I mean, again, and the, you know, the most obvious example that comes to mind again is the Second World War and the Jews, where you know, the Jews were put in ghettos. Um, they were given very little to eat. Their medical condition was horrendous. You know, they were sick, diseased, starving. And Goebbels would come to the ghettos and he'd say, look at those Jews. They can't be allowed to live. No, in other words, you're creating these dehumanizing conditions. They look like animals, he said. Right? You create the conditions of dehumanization. Same thing happened to the Armenian genocide. When the Armenians were sent out into the desert, you know, they had no food. They wouldn't be given any water. They were stripped of their clothes. They were wandering around in the, in the, the desert, and the Turks would say, you've got to kill them. No, they're animals. So you create this dehumanizing atmosphere. And then you also give them names. You know, the names of animals, the names of insects. You know, the Tutsi were called Inyenzi, cockroaches, uh, by the Hutu. Um, you know, there's dehumanization all around. I mean, this goes, by the way, for uh, kulaks in the Soviet Union, you know, who were also called monk. They were monkeys, they were lepers, they were um, uh, rats. Um, and the various sorts of names, and you portray these people in that way, and that kind of dehumanization you see everywhere in genocide. Uh, racism is an important part of this, and even if you go far, you know, the racism in genocide goes back really to the Spanish uh, in the New World, uh, which I cover in some detail in the book. I mean, I believe that that's one of the worst genocides in history, is what happened in the New World. Um, you know, in the, in the uh, 16th century, um, this was, you know, by any 
stretch of anybody's imagination a, a, a genocide. And what basically happens there, there's a kind of argument that goes on. There's a disputation. Are these Indians human or not? And this is a Valladoid uh, disputation. And one of them, uh, one of the disputants, a man named um, uh, Sepulveda, you know, has a big boulevard named after him in, in Los Angeles, um, you know, says, no, they're not. They're, they're not humans. They're not animals. They're someplace in between. And he goes into this elaborate, you know, the proof that these are not humans. And the conquistadors and their, uh, and their um, uh, aides also thought of the Indians as less than human and, and, and then engaged in the process of dehumanizing them even more. And this happens throughout the history of, uh, of um, uh, genocide, you know, and the, the trek boars in South Africa. Um, one of the groups I deal with are the sand people, so-called bushmen in South Africa, who over a period of several centuries actually are wiped out completely in South Africa. They're back now because they, some um, uh, uh, sand people migrated from the north into South Africa. But they were at one point completely wiped out. And the trek boars said over and over again, these are not human beings. You know, they, they were hunter-gatherers. And for the trek boars, that meant um, uh, uh, less than, less than uh, uh, human. Another theme, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this one and then mention a few more and then go to conclusions very quickly, are economic motivations. I want to mention this because it's very important. A new branch of kind of research uh, on genocide uh, is looking into the economic motivations of genocide. We had your, your colleague and friend Adam Tooze here who wrote a very fine book about, about um, you know, the economic bases of the Holocaust. And what you find is that ministries, military ministries in the Nazi Germany basically were demanding that the Jews be you know, expropriated, that their property be taken away, and also that they be used as forced labor. And then when there was a shortage of food on the Eastern Front, they demanded that they not be fed. So, you know, this builds into a genocidal situation. It helps, it helps create a genocide. Same thing with the Armenians. You know, we're finding more and more that the ministries in the Ottoman Empire were looking to Armenian property. Get rid of those Armenians so we can seize their property and pay for our war. And if you take a look at the, the category of settler genocide, which is a, a chapter in the book. You know, settler genocide is this case where white men and women come to an area, colon, colonizing this area, um, and they look at this land and they say, you know, those Indians or those Aborigines or those sand people, you know, cannot make anything out of that land. Therefore, it belongs to us, and we will take it over. What do they want the land for? They want it to survive, first of all, but second of all, also to, you know, build their wealth. So in Tasmania, which is a case I look at, the elimination of the Tasmanian Aborigines, you know, it's a clear case. They want the land so that they can get, put their sheep on that land so they can sell the wool to England at very high prices in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, and therefore anything goes when it comes to getting that land, and they essentially organize themselves into murdering the Tasmanian Aborigines. Same thing happens to the Yuki Indians, as I said, up in, um, uh, up in the Mendocino area, a place called Round Valley. Um, and by the way, California in general, I mean, we should all know, there's a new book by a, a man at UCLA named Benjamin Madley called, Gen I think it's called uh, California Genocide, something like that. And he documents, it's not just the Yuki Indians, I mean, hundreds of tribes, end of the 19th century, were wiped out you know, for the purposes of seizing their resources. So economics is very important, too. Let me just, I'm just going to list a few other themes and then go to a couple words of conclusion. First of all, another theme is cumulative radicalization. This is important. There are dynamics of genocide itself. You see it building you know, to a kind of powerful point. Of, of intense killing, and then it 
and then it kind of fades away. And you see this in almost all the cases of genocide. You also see genocide spreading. In other words, the target, let's say, is the Jews. But you end up killing gypsies, you end up killing Poles, you end up killing others, right? And you, would, you, know, you look to kill homosexuals as well and others. Right, so it spread. Same thing with the Armenians. I mean, you, you then kill Syriac Christians, you kill um, uh, Greeks. So it spreads. Genocide has a way of spreading, you know, from one target to other targets. And this goes with the Indians, too. There's gratuitous violence, which is one of the saddest parts of this story. You know, people are not just killed. You know, they're tortured, they're maimed, they're brutalized. Uh, in all kinds of ways. And then there's an important gender element uh, uh, to genocide. I, I won't get into that now. If you want to talk about it, we can. And finally, there are issues of causation, but I'm going to leave that. So, to conclude, um, you know, this kind of history <clears throat> demonstrates uh, that genocide is everywhere. Uh, it permeates everything. It's in our consciousness. And not only that, we are capable of it. I mean, it's very important to understand. You know, we're not unusual. I mean, it's there and it's available, you know, uh, in times that are often bad times. They're often war-like times. Um, you can imagine, you know, you can play a kind of mind game even with World War II in this country and what happened to the Japanese. It wasn't genocide, of course. Uh, not that many Japanese died when they were taken off into the mountains and put in those camps. But your mind game, if you think about it, what if the Japanese had, you know, attacked in Alaska and were fighting their way down into, uh, into the state of Washington? What would we have done to those Japanese? You know, you don't know. And so it's not, it's not you know, one of the things I try to share with students is this is not inconceivable for our own societies, right? This is not something that belongs to weird and strange places somewhere else only. <clears throat> and the final thing I would say is there is a glimmer of hope. And that glimmer of hope, you know, comes from some recent research that's been done by a number of people, uh, most prominently uh, a man named uh, Pinker, some of you may know uh, the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which demonstrates I think pretty convincingly. I, mean, I was skeptical in the beginning, I have to say, but by the end I was convinced by his empirical work that actually the incidence of violence, genocide, rape, homicide, all these sort of terrible aspects of killing have gone down over the centuries. And very, you know, there's a, obviously a terrible bleep in the middle of the 20th century going up, right? but that the general curve is going down. And he attributes this, and you can think about it too, you know, to changes in norms, changes in institutions, changes in the way nations deal with each other. Uh, but it, of course, it doesn't mean there's going to be no genocide. And it doesn't mean there can't be another big blip, like the middle of the 20th century in genocide. But it does mean, on the whole, I think, that we're coming to terms with what it means, and that eventually, maybe, Hopefully, sometime in the distant future, there'll be no more genocide. Thank you very much. So we have uh, two commentators, and I'm just going to introduce them uh, both now, and then they'll, they'll uh, give their remarks. So Dirk Rupno is the Stanford 2016-2017 Distinguished Visiting Austrian Chair Professor. He is a professor of contemporary history, head of the Institute for Contemporary History, and founding coordinator of the Center for Migration and Globalization at the University of Innsbruck. His interests include 20th century European history, Holocaust and Jewish studies, culture and politics of memory, and intellectual and migration history. And his current research focuses on developing an inclusive narrative of post-war Austrian uh, history. Uh, Beth Van Schock is the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School, where she teaches in the areas of international human rights, 
international criminal law and atrocities prevention. And she is a faculty fellow with the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Stanford. So prior to returning to academia, she served as a deputy to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Office of Global Criminal Justice of the US Department of State. Uh, and prior to that, uh, she was the professor of law at Santa Clara uh, University School of Law. So thank you both. And I think Dirk's gonna start. Yeah, thank you, Ken. And uh, let me start by really thanking the Europe Center to host me here, not only this event, but the Europe Center hosts me here for half a year. That's very, uh, uh, very gracious. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And it's really a pleasure to be here at uh, Norman's uh, book presentation, a pleasure and an honor and a privilege and to comment on his, uh, his newest book, Genocide, uh, A World History. So thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, occasion here. Uh, so what good can be said uh, um, about a book on genocide, right? I mean, I think that's the, the, that's the crucial and central question here uh, when it comes to Norman's um, book. And I think it is really impressive, Norman said that at the beginning, uh, what the limits were, it's, it's, you know, it's published in a specific series of short introductions to global history. Uh, it's really impressive, I think, uh, how uh, Norman is able uh, to cover 3,000 years uh, of history and the whole globe in less than 200 uh, pages, including also a discussion of the concept of genocide, these uh, conceptual questions that you also mentioned at the beginning, how it came about, what the problems might be of that concept, and so on, and so on, and so on. Of course, he doesn't mention all the cases. You said that you had to cut out some cases, and there are many more, and we might even don't know all the cases. Uh, of course, he doesn't mention all the cases of genocide, doesn't give you all the details and all the aspects that could be said when it comes to a uh, or could be covered when it comes to a, a history of genocide. Uh, but looking at other books that uh, colleagues of us ha have written, 800-page uh, studies on one specific case, or some colleagues even multi-volume uh, books on the history uh, of uh, genocide, then I think it's, uh, it's really a, a huge accomplishment uh, to come up with a concise, short 200-page a history that will be, of course, great for all of us to use in the classroom, uh, and also a great and in interesting read for people outside uh, academia. So I think that's really a great uh, accomplishment of that book. And you know, uh, you know, as it always is, length that does not necessarily translate into clarity when it comes to academic publishing. So I think also this. Uh, here, this, uh, these 200 pages with this very concise narrative that it, it does a lot somehow on clarifying up some things, I had the feeling after reading it. So at the same time, and that's also important, I think, uh, he does a fantastic job in balancing uh, an overarching narrative of the different events in these 3,000 3, years, but also giving you details and even voices uh, of victims, observers, uh, sometimes perpetrators, but I think it's more important to bring in the voices uh, of victims and also <coughs> observers, uh, testimonies, of course, and they are, as you can easily imagine, I mean, they are extremely gruesome. I'm, that's what the, what genocides are about, right? And I think it's, very important that we get these these looks on the ground, what's really going on, not just numbers and years and decisions taking, taken, uh, how it comes to genocides in these specific cases, but it's important to get also this look on the ground, what is really going on when a genocide happens, when it takes place. Um, and I, I'm sure you are familiar with the, I mean, there's a huge discussion especially coming from, uh, from the field of Holocaust studies on questions of how to represent the Holocaust properly, right? And it also translates into a discussion uh, how to uh, represent it in memorials, for example, in uh, books for schools, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Uh, and in recent years, I think there has been a shift and many people would say, oh, you know, 
uh, or I mean, the, maybe the shift was a little bit earlier. Now we're already shifting back a bit, but there was at least at some point uh, a shift saying, um, we cannot give all the gruesome details. We cannot show all the gruesome photographs uh, from the piles of bodies in concentration camps, in memorials. It's just too much for people, for school children coming to a memorial and to see that they might be traumatized, uh, etc. I think you are familiar with these uh, discussions. Um, at the same time, if you get a totally sanitized, clean uh, picture of genocides, not only like the Holocaust, I think you don't get the whole story. So I think it's really important to bring in these voices and bring in these details to give a complete picture of what's going on. And again, I think Norman does an extremely good job in 200 pages, balance, balancing that, giving an overarching narrative with all the important information, and at the same time, some, you know, some looks at what's going on uh, on the ground uh, when it comes to... Um, to genocides. So genocide is uh, obviously a tricky concept. And you said that at the uh, beginning, right? I mean, it's, uh, and, and it's, it's also demonstrated in the fact that not only historians here talk about it, but historians with someone coming from the law faculty, right? So that gives you the whole problem, basically, right? Um, it's a concept that is shared by historians and people in law, right? So that's, the, and that's, we, we, in history, we don't have many concepts like that, that we really share with other disciplines. And, and here, of course, the point is the other discipline actually defines it, right? It's, I mean, genocide is a defined concept in international law, and we as historians take it up. Uh, and work with it. So that's, that's of course, a very interesting uh, constellation. This is why I'm very happy that we can discuss it here with uh, Beth, because that makes it, uh, that really brings us, I think, to the core of the, this, uh, um, uh, this concept of genocide and how we have to think about it. Um, so that might not be a surprise uh, since the concept, and we haven't, I think we haven't even mentioned the name Raphael Lemkin. Yeah, so I guess that has to be done, right? We owe this concept of genocide, uh, which is a newly invented term in the mid of the 20th century, uh, um, the Polish Jewish lawyer, uh, Raphael um, Lemkin. And he was trained as a lawyer uh, and wanted to introduce this concept for what he called the crime of crimes. Uh, ended up then naming it genocide by trying other uh, concepts before, like barbari uh, barbarianism, I think, you, you said bar barbarism, right? Um, barbarism and vandalism, um, but ends up by inventing this new term, genocide, bringing uh, uh, Greek and Latin basically together in one um, term. But, uh, Lemkin being a lawyer, uh, and that's very interesting, of course, how this whole field developed, uh, was interested in the history of what he called genocide. And actually, he tried to make his argument for this new concept in international law by looking back into history, right? Um, so already in Lemkin, these two aspects come together, law and history, and they come together when he thinks about how to uh, define um, this new concept uh, in uh, international law. And you could, of course, say uh, uh, Lemkin would have had enough by just looking at his present, right? The Holocaust was going on. Lemkin fled the Holocaust. Most of his family was consumed uh, by the Holocaust. Um, uh, in Europe. But in fact, Lemkin started being interested uh, in this, what he later called genocide, before the Holocaust. After he learned about the Armenian, after he learned what happened to the Armenians during World War I. Let's say that. So the Armenian genocide. Uh, so he got interested in that already in the 20s and or early 30s before the Holocaust uh, 
uh, happened. And uh, you might know that Lemkin published an important book in 1944, I think, uh, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, um, which deals at the same time a lot with the Holocaust or what happens to the Jews in Nazi Germany and in all occupied Europe, as the book title uh, suggests. Uh, but he also laid out uh, a plan for a, yeah, I, I think we can say huge uh, history of genocides, tracing it back as Norman does in his uh, book to antiquity. Right? And this is not has not been completed. We, I think in different archives we have parts of it. Uh, some of it has been edited in different volumes, but we don't have the whole book in hand. But we know his plans, right? And we have a list of the genocides he wanted to cover. Uh, and just as Norman does in his book, he starts uh, with antiquity and the cases that you mentioned at the beginning. Of course, many other cases come in. Uh, so, I mean, his book wouldn't have been only 200 pages, but I think really a multi-volume uh, thing. But I think that's also, in, I mean, at first it's interesting to keep that in mind. You know, we have this, um, we could also say maybe a, it's not a competition. Now it might be a competition. At the beginning it wasn't a competition, uh, you know, when it comes to this term. Now it might be a competition between uh, people from law and from history uh, talking about genocide. Lemkin at the beginning incorporated it in himself, right? I mean, thinking historically about genocide and uh, in terms of law and how he could translate it into a punishable crime um, uh, in international uh, law, but at the same time, of course, it's something else to translate something into punishable crime and writing historiographically about it, right? It has total different ramifications uh, and things you need to keep in mind and so on and so on. For the law side, of course, it's important this point of intention, right? You mentioned that um, as a proof that there is a crime, right? At the same time, now from recent research, also on the Holocaust, mostly on the Holocaust, we know it's not that easy with intentions, right? I mean, how, especially how do you demonstrate Hitler's intention to kill all the Jews after a specific point in time, right? This is why German historians, and not only German, but, but other historians try to find a letter of Hitler saying, from tomorrow on, start killing all the Jews of Europe. It doesn't exist. We know it has never existed. It, it doesn't exist. Uh, because this is not how genocide works. You said that, uh, or you mentioned that uh, term cumulative uh, radicalization, <coughs> uh, which was, of course, created uh, in the field of Holocaust studies. Uh, after it became clear, there was not just one decision taken at one moment, but it was a gradual development, um, and there is, at the same time, that makes clear there is not one document saying, okay, now we do it. It starts happening at speci in specific areas in occupied Europe, at, even at different times. Some start be a little bit earlier, some come in later, and so on. So it's, it's very hard to trace that, and it's very hard then to make a case in court if you don't have this document saying, okay, Hitler decided about it. You know, this is why, because uh, um, some historians argued already in the 80s, uh, it was only Himmler. Hitler didn't knew about it, right? Like David Irving, right? It was only Himmler's decision to do it. But the Fuhrer, of course, did not know about the Holocaust because there's no one written document that can demonstrate that. Anyway, so this, this brings up also other questions like, you know, what does it actually, and you said that also at the beginning, what does it actually mean to apply uh, this uh, concept uh, in history before it was even in place, right? What, what does it mean to say it was a genocide what happened in antiquity? And how do we actually prove that? Because we don't have the sources to get a clear proof of it, right? I mean, there are, of course, narratives about it and... You know, is it literature or is it a fact? Who knows? Maybe it's an alternative fact. You never know. So uh, uh, how do we, pre you know, you could never make a case in court, right, about these cases in antiquity. So what does it actually mean to apply that uh, concept to, uh, uh, to historical cases that, that are, you know, really far away in history and we don't have proper documentation? Um, 
about that. And that's maybe something we can, could also discuss then later on. <coughs> Uh, podium. Let me say something else uh, also related to the Holocaust, especially, uh, you know, since I'm, you know, a German, German-Austrian coming here to the States, so the Holocaust is not only part of, of history for me, but it's also part of my family history, of course, and, you know, and my generation of my grandparents, uh, and I'm, you know, trained as a Holocaust historian somehow, spent a lot of time at specific institutions dealing with the a history of the Holocaust, like the USHMM in DC, and so on and so on. Very interesting because also these institutions moved on in recent years to a broader understanding of uh, genocide, incorporating them. It was possible at the beginning of the USHMM to talk about other genocides there. Now it's just the everyday business. Uh, and of course, also coming as a uh, as someone who plans to teach a course on the Holocaust here in the spring quarter, right, uh, to the students. So. Um, so I have to take up um, uh, the fact that Norman only writes nine pages about it. And some people will be shocked, I'm sure, and say, how can you, right? I mean, how dare you only write nine pages about the Holocaust, the most important genocide in history in your book on genocides? And some people, of course, would also say, in fact, the book should only be about the Holocaust and no other cases should be mentioned, right? And I, th I read the book uh, by, you know, uh, by chance when uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, came up uh, with this very weird statement by uh, Trump's uh, White House staff, right? And this also, I think, brings up a very interesting question, you know, interesting question. How do we talk about a specific, is, is suffering of a specific group without leaving out of the picture the suffering of others. If you follow the rhetoric about uh, around uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Europe or in Germany especially, you could think you know there has never been another genocide in world history, and and certainly no other genocide that Europeans took part in it, right? It's, we, we still have this rhetoric of the Holocaust is the only and the most gruesome genocide, and so on and so on and so on. And of course, that's, that's an accomplishment of our memorial culture. Uh, I think that we now face this history, but at the same time, it brings up this question, how do we talk about the suffering of a group without diminishing uh, the suffering of other groups? And this is, I think, also somehow, uh, or comes up with this weird statement uh, from the White House. So let me end here, uh, and I think the rest is uh, for the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for including me in this really fascinating conversation. I do apologize for sort of skulking in. Um, I teach until noon over at the law school, so I raced here as quickly as I could, um, and I'm glad I was able to attend most of the substantive discussion. Um, so as Dirk mentioned, and as, as de portrayed and depicted in the book, the concept of genocide, quad genocide, really does trace back to Raphael Lemkin. And he was the first to notice that this was a crime without a name. And so he had to come up with a neologian in order to reflect what had happened. And part of my work as an international lawyer is really to engage in the question of, of definition because my engagement with this book really starts around chapter five because that's when the idea of genocide as a prosecutable offense starts to develop. And if you trace the definition of genocide and how it evolved um, to ultimately arrive at the definition that we do have in the Genocide Convention, which is a multilateral treaty signed and ratified by many states of the world, most states of the world at this point, um, we can describe it almost as an hourglass sort of um, structure where Raphael Lemkin had in mind a very broad idea of what genocide was and really very much would have captured many, many of the cases that are you in, in antiquity and, and moving forward that are portrayed so beautifully and, and, con and concisely in this book. Um, he was concerned about the loss of human diversity. He was concerned about the loss of our, our customs as a species. He was concerned about how the rest of us suffer when one group is removed from amongst our midst. And that's really what he cared about. And so he had this very broad notion of genocide. Then, um, because of his tireless work, and he really was, I think, a gadfly. I mean, he was, you know, anyone who would listen to him, he would talk about the need to draft something that would prevent and punish the, uh, this, this new concept that he had come up with and that he had seen happen so starkly in the World War I period. Um, eventually, the General Assembly of the United Nations took this up, and they put forth a declaration against genocide. Now, nobody looks at that anymore because we're so focused on the treaty, but this definition was a much, the definition of genocide in this declaration 
Declaration was a much more expansive, much broader notion that included different groups. It made greater reference to the idea of culture, the loss of human culture, not just the loss of human life. And that served as a sort of stepping stone for several years to the eventual drafting of a treaty. Now what happens when we got into the treaty drafting process is suddenly states were understanding that they were taking on potentially legal obligations. These were going to be firm, hard obligations. They would ratify that treaty, potentially incorporate the provisions of that treaty into their domestic codes. They would carry certain obligations with them by virtue of being members. And so that's where we see the even stronger whittling down of the definition. So as Norm mentioned political groups fall away, social groups fall away, any notion of cultural genocide falls away. We get this very strong attention to intent, as Dirk speaks of, and it, the treaty itself becomes much more of a sort of retrospective condemnation of what had happened in World War II and less of a sociological understanding of this long practice of one group aiming to destroy another human group, whether out of competition or fear or dehumanization, whatever the underlying motivations are. And so then we get the definition. And it has proven to be remarkably sticky. The international community has a number of, of opportunities to go back and revisit that definition. And they've never changed it. It's sacrosanct at this point. So even as recently as to, uh, the late 1990s, when they were drafting the statute for the International Criminal Court, there was some talk about expanding the definition and it was immediately shut down. And so we have consistently carried forward that definition in our codifications when we're talking about legal obligations. Where we do see some changes is when states have incorporated the definition into their domestic penal codes, they've occasionally made some very idiosyncratic changes. And so Spain expanded the list of definitions, uh, the list of groups in the definition. Ethiopia added political groups, very much res reflecting its own history with genocide under the Mengistu regime. So we see these idiosyncratic changes, but as a general rule, it's been quite sticky. Now here's where we turn the corner of the hourglass, because now suddenly we have a definition in penal codes, both national and international, and now judges get a hold of it. Judges are not bound by the sort of political concerns about scrutiny on their own history, trying to make sure their practices against the kulaks, against the anti-communist um, purges in Indonesia, what Stalin was doing, what Mao was doing, what we did with respect to the Native Americans. None of the states, as they were involved in those negotiations around the treaty, did not want their own history to be reflected in this treaty. And so we get this narrowing. Judges, however, are not bound by some of those political considerations. And we've seen a really interesting expansion, again, of the idea of genocide at the hands of judges faced with situations of mass violence against a, a identifiable group of persons. And so when it comes to the groups protected, for example, in Rwanda, we had the Hutu and the Tutsi, which if we're sort of intellectually lazy, we say, oh, they're different ethnic groups. But if we really think about the concept of ethnicity, we see that they, had, they shared many of the characteristics that we think think about distinguishing ethnic groups, language, culture, religion. The Hutus and the Tutsis were very similar in those regards. They were probably better described as either an economic or a social group that was traced back to the colonial experience. Again, a case that you describe very accurately in the book of the Belgians needing a way to sort of divide and conquer and to coming up with a system that then became concretized on individual identity cards, which then were used to effectuate the genocide because you could identify who was a Tutsi and who was a Hutu just by virtue of the social convention of the identity card. And so the judges of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which had to decide whether or not what everyone thought of as the first post-Holocaust genocide was in fact a genocide under international law, were very sophisticated about the way they thought about ethnicity and the way they thought about social convention and the way they were able to say, in essence, these groups were treated as an ethnic group, they often thought of themselves in those terms, and therefore we're going to accept that subjective notion and find genocide here. Likewise, when it comes to sexual violence, and I'm, I'm so pleased that your book makes such an important effort at every step along the way to show the way in which gender-based and sexual violence is really a tool to commit genocide. Again, the Rwanda Tribunal had to deal with the question of whether or not rape, standing alone, was a constitutive act of genocide. The victims were not killed. They survived and they ultimately testified. Interestingly, as the story goes, um, the original indictment in some of the early cases before the Rwanda Tribunal 
didn't mention rape as one of the constitutive acts of genocide. It talked about acts of murder, mistreatment, torture, detention. Rape was not mentioned. When women took the stand and began to testify about their experience and how they held the particular defendant responsible, in this case a burgomeister, um, Akayesu, they all described being rape. And the judges stopped the proceedings and said, prosecutors, why have you not charged this? And they sort of, uh, you know, did a little, little bit of a dance. And the judges actually said, we're going to take a continuance. I want you to go back and redraft your indictment. We're going to accept an amended indictment. And sure enough, those charges got put in. And the tribunal confirmed that acts of rape standing alone when the victim survives is part of that effort to destroy a group in whole or in part. The, the destructive impact of that level of violence was such that it constituted genocide. In the Yugoslavia context, we see the idea of slow death. So many people in the colloquial sense think of genocide as being the equivalent of mass killing. That's where our instincts go. And if you actually look at the constitutive acts that can constitute genocide, we see that causing serious bodily and mental harm or creating conditions of life calculated to destroy the group in whole or in part can qualify as genocide. And the tribunals have been very careful about recognizing these ideas of slow death, the creation of conditions that inevitably will lead to the death of the group. It's much easier sometimes to do that, to starve a population and let nature take its course, rather than having to slaughter hundreds of thousands of people and then deal with the bodies. And so the tribunals have allowed the idea of slow death to serve as a predicate or a, 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 um, a source of a genocide conviction. Um, finally, the one, one piece where I think the Genocide Convention itself and where Norman ended his talk, um, and Dirk too in a, in a sense, is the idea of prevention. Um, the convention is called the Convention to Prevent and Punish the Crime of Genocide. We've been very focused on ex post con convictions, on prosecutions, on using the penal law to enforce a particular international norm. Very little conceptual work has been done on what does it mean to prevent and what tools do we have to prevent. And only since the genocide in Rwanda has the international community really begun to think about what does it mean to be preventative? What tools do we have in the sort of foreign policy, development, et cetera, toolkit? And this is where having someone like Samantha Power, who writes her book on you know, genocides over the years and the failure of US policy in the face of active genocides, with the Rwanda case being the sort of apex of this long history, Having her in a government position was really central. She pushed President Obama to create the Atrocities Prevention Board, which is an interagency body that met monthly. I sat on the board when I was in government. My office was represented. The State Department was represented. And every month, we took a look, a deep dive, on a situation that was potentially at risk. So Burundi, two and a half years ago, three years ago, was already on the agenda of the APB. Why? Because the risk factors were there, the kind of dehumanization you talk about, the um, conflict over resources, um, trigger events, the president deciding to extend unconstitutionally his term. All of those risk factors that we now recognize from this traits through history, looking at the indicators, looking at the escalating factors, looking at the triggering events, all of those were in place. And the US government, working with partners and the United Nations, were able to serve attention on Burundi. Whether or not we made a difference, we'll never know. That's a parallel universe that we don't live in. But at least it has now triggered a sensitivity and a degree of international attention to the idea of prevention so that we might eventually, as a world community, get to the point where you ended your talk. And the good news story is getting to the point where we can actually think about how to prevent acts of genocide. So I'll rest there, and I'm happy to discuss more of this in our Q&A conversation. I was just wondering if you, um, if the witch burnings could be considered uh, genocide. I mean, sometimes uh, feminists call it a holocaust, a woman's holocaust. I just wondered. It's a fascinating question. So gen gender is not listed as one of the protected groups. But if we think about a modern conception of it, of a sort of Wiccan religion, um, certainly you could fit it in under the classical conventional definition of, as a religious group. Um, but we do have a very interesting case coming out of the Yugoslavia Tribunal involving the Srebrenica massacre, where we had the enclave of Srebrenica, UN peacekeepers retreat, allow the Serbs to enter, they separate the men and boys from the women and younger children and girls, the women and children are shipped out, the men are all killed. So here we have the opposite, where we have killings against men, and there the tribunal said the elimination of one half of the community by gender 
was in itself genocide as well. So you can imagine a sort of flip using your, um, your case study. Uh, would you qualify what's happening to the Rohingyas uh, now as genocide? And if yes, no, do you have any idea of uh, what could be better done maybe by the UN or other nations to, to stop it? So, uh, I mean, I would say a couple of things um, about this issue of what is and what is not genocide. You know, that, that kind of issue becomes, in some ways, hampers action mm -hmm. of the international community. So when you're talking about a contemporary challenge, like the killing and the discrimination and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the repression of the Rohingyas, you know, I, I think it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to worry about whether it's genocide or a crime against humanity. You know, or a war crime, all three of those categories under the, under the ICC mm -hmm. are supposed to be prosecuted internationally. Um, you know, in order to really get a sense of the, of the kind of, well, the, you know, historians will look at this differently than, than lawyers, perhaps, but, but in order to really get a sense of it, you need to know a lot more than I know right now to say, yes, this is genocide. But e even when we were talking about Darfur, you know, in the mm -hmm. beginning of the of this century, was it genocide? It was not mm -hmm. genocide. The, you know, the administration said it was genocide. The uh, UN said it wasn't mm -hmm. genocide. You know, th that kind of argument can get you into a lot of problems, it seems to me, when acting internationally. So I prefer to say, I looked on a list of, um, you know, on an NGO's list of you know, contemporary genocides, just to, to, you know, get myself a little bit up to date since writing the book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and this was listed, you know, as, a, as an extreme emergency. And I think it probably is an extreme emergency and should be acted on. Whether it's genocide or not, at this point, I, I wouldn't hesitate to answer, but I don't think that minimizes the fact that it is indeed an extreme emergency. Um, I asked this question admit, admittedly not having yet read the book, but um, I'm interested if you could talk a little more about the role of the state. Uh, if putting genocide into this broad historical context, both geographically and temporally, you're dealing with very different kinds of regimes and very different kinds of states. And if you're calling these different events all genocide, are you reaching the conclusion that the kind of regime doesn't really make a difference. Uh, and another aspect that I was hoping you could comment on is this relationship between um, sort of the global phenomena, which you're arguing that genocide is, and it seems to me compellingly, and issues of state and sovereignty, and what this relationship might mean for um, both the per uh, perpetration of genocide, but also for its prevention. Okay, uh, uh, good question about the state. I mean, I, I should um, uh, confess, admit, whatever, that, um, you know, for a very long time, uh, I thought that when I began my studies of genocide, which were in the mid-90s, basically, with the Bosnian War, um, you know, my view was uh, that the state was an important part of the dynamic of genocide. And that, um, because when you get to the bottom of it all, in other words, it wasn't necessarily individuals who were as responsible as states and political leaders, right, within those states. You know? uh, um, and so that was a, a factor in the first book I wrote about genocide, which was, um, you know, Fires of Hatred, you know, you know uh, 2003, uh, on Amazon for it. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that, that book also reflected what I think is a lot of problems with thinking about genocide, which is the hubris, really, of, of, of us, meaning of our, um, of our civilization and how we live as modern or postmodern human beings. We live with a state, a state is all-powerful, and the state ends up being uh, a major perpetrator and involved in virtually all the genocides that we think of, you know, from Bosnia to, uh, you know, to Rwanda, to uh, the Holocaust, to the Armenian genocide, you know, all the big 20th century genocides, and even small ones. You know, the state has a lot to do with the Rohingya, right, uh, in Myanmar. So, um, uh, but then, you know, people, just, you know, it talks like this. People would raise their hands and say, well, what about Native Americans? 
well, I don't really know about Native Americans, I don't know about American history. And, you know, what about uh, going back even further, you know? Um, what about uh, the Indians in, in uh, the Americas when the, uh, when the conquistadors and Spanish came? I said, I really don't know anything about that either. <laughs> and, you know, and so I decided to start looking at this stuff and I realized that you don't need a state for genocide. Mm -hmm. You don't need a state. You know, if I then am willing to talk about all these events and, and uh, in the past and antiquity as well, then these are really not state, m mostly not state-driven events. I mean, the Romans in Carthage were, I mean, this was the Roman state, the Roman Senate. People were really hated Carthage and they wanted to kill them. <laughs> so, you know, that probably resembles it most. And, you know, the Athenian state, yes, was responsible for what happened in Milos, you know, when they wiped out the Miletians. So, you know, the, there are, if you want to call those states, you know, they're primitive states, they're proto-states. Um, you know, are the Mongols a state? No, you know, I wouldn't call them that, right? So, so I think that what, we need to complicate our ideas about the state, but I think you're right to identify the state as an important element of all this. Now, the sovereignty question mm -hmm. and the state in, in our day is a very important one, and they, and you may know that the the genocides of the 90s, uh, you know, ended up, and and the successful intervention in Kosovo was very important. This ended up producing, you know, a document or a way of thinking called the responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. which has been adopted by the UN. And the responsibility to protect basically says the sovereign state is responsible to protect its citizens against genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, you know, torture and that kind of thing. And if it doesn't, it's, it's incumbent upon the world community to do something about it. So sovereignty in some ways has been limited in this way, in this doctrine. Now, the Syria, you know, presented a really big problem, but in Responsibility to Protect, it says quite clearly you don't do anything which is going to, you know, be asymmetrical, hurt too many people, or hurt too many of your people, right? In other words, intervention and preemption is called for, but not, not, you know, not in a way that it is going to destroy more lives than it's going to save. So, um, and I'm sorry about the long answer, but you know, that's that's, um, uh, that's the story of sovereignty. It's now considered limited. Norman, first of all, I wish to congratulate you. I haven't read the book either, although I already have it. <laughs> I have two quick questions. First, for you, uh, I don't know, do you get in the book into the question of, let me put it, let me try to wedge the question between what you ended on, which is the glimmer of hope on the one hand, and this clause of comma as such that you were referring to. I understand the norms of civilized behavior have had their effect, thankfully. How about the technologies of genocide, the modernity bringing on ever more efficient means of fulfilling indeed the genocidal dream of as such? I don't know if you get into that and whether you have any comments. And my second quick question is for you or for the panel about the post-genocide effects, which is to say, uh, the extent to which there are cases, it's not always the case I would take it with genocide, but there are certainly modern cases where the identities that are produced through genocide are the identities that actually are then, post-genocide, taken as valid political and other categories. And what do we conclude from that? Thank you. Maybe I'll take the first question, you guys can <laughs> chime in on the second one, or I can do that one too. I just don't want to talk all the time, and I can. Um, uh, as my wife knows. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, technologies of genocide. Yeah. Yeah, you know, again, in this Fires of Hatred book, I made a big deal out of it. Again, as a 20th century person and as, a, you know, a modern, postmodern, you know, we all believe that technology is trans, you know, um, transforming everything and that nothing is like it was, you know, that we were special and that our societies are special because of it. I don't believe that. And part of it is, it, because the destructiveness in the old days, you know, was horrific. I mean, they could destroy a lot of people in a very short time. And part of the story is, 
you know, as you may know, what happened in Rwanda is they used, uh, you know, machetes. machetes. I mean, they mm -hmm. imported machetes from China, zillions of them, and they went out with machetes and killed people. And even if you look at the Germans, you know, we, we think a lot about the, we think a lot about, um, uh, you know, concentration camps and industrial killing and all this stuff. Um, and I spent some time, for a variety of reasons, this summer looking at killing, mass killing in the, in the Eastern Front. You know, it was often, you know, just guns, you know, which have been there for centuries. You know, executions, you know, mass executions. Uh, just one after another. And, and you know, the, the, I don't know if you ever uh, saw this cutting movie, which sticks in my head. You know, the killing of the 22,000 mm -hmm. Polish officers. And it was one or two men with a revolver, you know, shooting people in the back of the head. And 22,000 people, they did this. Um, so, you know, advanced technology, the communications mm -hmm. is important, you know, this b ability to communicate. I mean, the Armenian genocide, you know, Holocaust, you know, this, uh, the radio in the case of Rwanda, you know, the communications are important. But I must say, again, if I, you know, you go back to periods, earlier periods, when such communications were unavailable, or even to the modern period, when they are available, but people don't really need them. They mobilize people in other ways. Okay, you want to answer the post? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, there is a long answer that would take another panel, I guess, and there is a short answer. This is, uh, it's just not part of your book, right? I mean, this is, of course, the limitation of 200 pages, right? I mean, you, you don't talk about all the things coming in in the aftermath, transi transitional justice mm -hmm. and all that, you know, trials, whatever. Uh, that's just not part of the book because of, it would have been too much for 200 pages, right? And, of course, it's an integral part when we talk about genocide or when we talk about genocide studies, for example, as an academic field. Uh, but I think it would be a different thing to bring it up, right? I mean, it's, it, it's an extremely important question, but it, it's just not covered in Norman's book. Right? Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm reading the book, and uh, I have questions to... Uh, all panelists, whoever wants to answer. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, what is the difference, according to you, between genocide and uh, crimes against humanities? And second question is, to me, it's very ethical questions. How many people must be killed so that it could be called genocide or etc.? And second question is about uh, uh, post-traumatic or post-genocide uh, effects. The, the thing is there are these um, ke chemical and biological studies which proves that uh, 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 the trauma can be uh, tra transmitted through generations through this level of uh, cortisol and, and usually children are not uh, quite um, resistant to stress and it, it changed their life. So in sense of legal aspects, uh, how that could change the uh, discussion of genocide? Thank you. Take it? I'll start with it. I got some thoughts on that and then we can have the co my colleagues as well. So genocide against crimes against humanity, this gets back to your point, how much does this really matter? Um, we have a concept called crimes against humanity which encompasses a constellation of acts that are prohibited under international law and considered criminal under international law when they're committed in the context of a widespread or a systematic attack against a population, a civilian population. So almost anything that would be genocide would also be a crime against humanity. It's more of an umbrella term. And your point about Darfur is an excellent one. What was the headline when the UN Commission of Inquiry came out with their finding that we couldn't decide whether it was genocide or not. That was the headline. Not the fact that there were massive crimes against humanity being committed in Darfur. And so it does become a distraction and we sort of are dancing on the head of a pin while people are dying and their villages are being burned. So it's a very useful umbrella term. In terms of numbers, there's a great case coming out of the Yugoslavia Tribunal um, involving Jelicic who called himself the Serb Adolf. And he mistreated and, and killed a handful and maybe no more than a dozen victims in total. Nonetheless, the court found genocide there. Why? Because it hinges on the intent. It's not necessarily about the quantitative outcome of the defendant's actions, but about what their intent was. And his intent was to destroy the Bosnian Muslim group in whole or in part. Um, and then the, the third part of your question on intergenerational trauma, 
um, Stanford has between the law school and the medical school a men drama mental health lab that deals with human rights violations. And there's lots and lots of evidence, particularly around the Holocaust and children and grandchildren of the Holocaust, that describes exactly the phenomenon that you're interested in, this idea of intergenerational transfer and the, the physical and physiological changes that happen to the brain of human beings under intense stress for long periods of time. That is an epigenetic phenomenon that then can be passed on to children and even grandchildren. And so it's a very real phenomenon. Our lab has put together briefs that have been filed in legal cases on behalf of victims to show and to demonstrate the kinds of harm, psychological and physical and intergenerational, that happens when a group of individuals is subjected to mass violence. Hi, I wanted to ask a question about uh genocides against religious groups in particular rather than ethno-religious groups. Mm -hmm. um, the history of the drafting, uh, drafting the Genocide Convention was that it initially included political groups and that they were taken out because people could move in and out of political groups. That's also true of religious groups, which, but they were included because, as uh, Beth said, it was really a retrospective condemnation of World War II. So my question is, now we're seeing, um, and we have seen in the past in Cambodia against the Cham Muslims, now with the Yazidis in northern Iraq and in Syria, um, attempts to wipe out entire groups which are ho solely religious groups rather than ethno-religious groups where their identities are quite mutable. In both cases there were killings, but my question is, it's, you now have a situation where you can destroy the groups without actually destroying the individuals within the groups. You can have a situation where you could force members of the groups apart, you could have forcible conversions. And I was wondering whether you felt that fell within the Genocide Convention or if it, you needed a reimagining of the concept of destruction in the Genocide Convention to deal with um, religious groups. Um, as, as solely religious groups. Sarita is not revealing the fact that she's written the <laughs> definitive paper on the Yazidi as a victim of genocide, but anyway. <laughs> you know, if, if I might, let me, let me do, I'm a consumer uh, of the law, meaning I read law school journals, which is one of the hardest things <laughs> that can ever read. It's even harder I mean, to write them, but whatever. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what they do to you over there. No. But it's a form of, t it's a crime against humanity. I'm I've spent so. a lot of time, and I've spent a lot of time reading the courtroom decisions, you know, especially in Bosnia, but also in Rwanda. And uh, it seems to me that the um, uh, two things need to be said. First of all, that uh, uh, mass murder, mass murder, is part of genocide. And, you know, it's not the only part of genocide, but it's part of genocide. So the way I read the convention, and I think the way most, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, the way most um, uh, lawyers read, the lawyers that I've read, read the convention is that these various statements down below, you know, about children being mm -hmm. taken away and that sort of thing, all have to be done in conjunction with killing, right? Now, in the case of the Yazidis, I don't know your work at all. <laughs> but if someone had asked, like, about the Rohingya, I would have answered the same way about the Yazidis. I just don't know enough. But the, as a religious group, yes, that is a I mean, under the Genocide Convention, that's clearly, it seems to me, a protected group. Um, and to destroy that group as a group, which I don't think has happened yet, but you may be, I mean, you can correct me, you know, and that the intention, if the intention is to destroy part or all of the group, then yes, then it's genocide. So, so you know, um, you have all these components of, of these various decisions. And again, I read a lot of them. And they, they put together evidence. I mean, it's not one thing, it's not another thing. But I think religion, you know, I, I mean, again, the co convention says religion, ethnic, national, <laughs> race. Right? Any of those four are the, are the privileged in some ways target groups of a genocide, of a genocide prosecution. Now you do have um, an interesting question. I mean, of course, one of the arguments that was raised for leaving out political groups, economic groups, social groups was this idea of immutability. And under contemporary conceptions, we see that all of these groups are mutable, right? If they're all social constructions at some level, even race, which you might think of as the most immutable, is a social construction. You have to draw the line somewhere as to who falls into one race or another. So that was the sort of principled argument. We know now, reading the drafting history as we all have, that it was much more about politics and why those groups fell away. But why should an individual have to give up what is an internationally protected human right, which is the right to choose one's faith, in order to stay alive? And to me, it seems if you're 
If your options are, I kill you or I forcibly convert you and you renounce your faith, um, that to me is still genocidal, even though the victim ultimately remains alive. They've, have, they've had to cleave themselves and a, an essential part of their identity has been taken away. All right, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But I, before we leave, I just want uh, you to join me in congratulating Norman yes. and thanking our discussants for uh, <laughs>